Dinner Conversations is brought to you by Food for the Hungry, a relief and development organization serving those in need around the globe for more than 40 years. Help our friends at Food for the Hungry save thousands of refugee lives today by considering a generous gift. A gift that will be matched 22 times. It's incredible. Visit fh.org forward slash dinner to give now. Today's guest is Becca Stevens, and Becca is an Episcopal priest, and years ago, 21 years ago, Russ Taft said, Mark, you got to hear this lady speak. He'd been going to her church, so I said, okay, and I went and heard her, was blown away. Not only is she a great speaker, she's got a great heart, and she started a ministry called Thistle Farms. Yeah, this amazing ministry that helps women in vulnerable places really restore them back uh, into society and culture. It helps heal them and also employ them. In fact, we had our first tea party mm -hmm. on Dinner Conversations. Did you enjoy the tea? It was delicious. Yes, uh, helped grown and packaged and sold by women who are helped by Thistle Farms. She's a wonderful author of a book called Love Heals and often says that love is the most powerful force to change our world today. And there's one seat left at the table, and it's yours. So let's join the conversation. One of the things I remember when I started this work 21 years ago, the first woman I met in the program, who is now the national director, has started programs all over the country. You know, she was in a cast. She was just off the street, just beaten and raped like so many women. I go into the house, it's three weeks into the program, and she is dancing. I mean, she is moving, and there is nobody in there, but she's playing gospel music. And I was like, what are you doing? I'm like, she's drunk. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It, and she goes, I'm having a Holy Ghost party. Yeah. And I was like, well, what's that? Yeah. You know, well, tell me. And we laughed and laughed, and then I think that was like the first time I cried, thinking like, this is a lot of work, but also this is going to change my life. I'm going to learn how to be moved by the Spirit where I dance with a cast on my huh. leg. Did that start the Thistle Minute? Is that the Thistle Farms? Thistle Farms. Is that where what it was started? the genesis? What was, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's where it started, was right that, there that in woman? Nashville on Park. Well, so that was the first house. She was one of the first five yeah. people. It was 1997. And I was just like, let's just move five women into a home, no authority in the house, don't charge them anything. And Let's just see where it goes. And you and Russ helped a lot get that going. I mean, it's fun. It's that awesome. That was originally called the Magdalene House, right? So the residences are still called Magdalene. Mm -hmm. So the whole branding is Thistle mm -hmm. Farms, how we put the products mm -hmm. out in the marketplace. So like now we're in every Whole Foods in the country. So you people are serious sure. about branding. And they want it to all be consistent. So everything is called Thistle Farms. Well, people, and people can know, they can go look up, they can find out about Thistle Farms. But I would like just for us at the table to talk, maybe while we serve some tea, yes. about one of the products here from Thistle Farms. But talk about kind of that, the holistic program that is Thistle Farms. From the coming into the home for two mm -hmm. years, right? And we're talking about women who are caught up in vulnerable places in their Family lives, relationships, what, I mean, what have you seen the stories well, I don't think they're caught you? up. In, okay. I mean, I think um, it's women who've been prostituted, addicted, imprisoned, raped, jailed, beaten, abused, sexually mm -hmm. assaulted, all mm -hmm. those things we say. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is about failed systems and communities from when the women are kids mm -hmm. and how it takes communities and people loving them without judgment back. You want to do it? Okay. Do you know in well, tea? Yes. I know, but that's but tea. The um, serving is the place of honor. Oh, real? okay. I so, know. you are mm -hmm. in our place of honor. And this is honor. my tea, so I would love to. Well, serve tell us you. more. What else do we need to learn? This place of honor is the. Well, serving. if you don't know that, there's probably a lot. I mean, that's right. I don't understand this. We never though. had tea. You just pour it, oh, and okay. it comes I think out. it just opens. Oh, up. Oh, it just yeah. opens up. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's an so tricky. Open uh -huh. vessel. Um, so yeah, when so when women, I mean, one, how did you first? see the need like i would say sometimes in our i don't know if you want to call it places of privilege or whatever seeing is the issue to me like how do i know when someone you know where did you find these first women or discover them in their plights uh, in their journeys of wanting freedom were they wanting freedom from their situations mm -hmm. i met the women when i was 
you know, I was already a minister, so I was doing some feeding programs on the streets. I had gone to jail just to interview some of the women and see what was out there. And um, the stories I was hearing, it was like, people need a really a sanctuary. They need a place to go. And all the institutions that I'm involved in aren't doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the church isn't building shelters like cathedrals. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's mostly just done on the cheap. And people don't feel like really loved and worthy. And it was like, if we're going to talk about healing women who really have had just the short side of everything, we got to do it in a lavish, beautiful way that feels mm. really safe and gives them time and space. And that's what we did. It was easy. But I think that always what the part that, you know, has just undone me the most is that I don't think it's ever been just about helping like a few women here and there. Mm -hmm. To me, it's always about opening up this, a conversation where you can say, how are we diseased? Yeah. How are we as a culture diseased? Why do we still buy and sell women as commodities? Why do we keep the secrets of childhood trauma in people's mm -hmm. lives? I mean, like, that's what I hope. I hope the products and the story help all of us feel like we can believe love heals us too from all the secrets of our own sexual shame or fears. Mm -hmm. you, wrote, you wrote a book called Love Heals. And I think about that, the title, Love Heals, just those two words, because I have been confronted by some people in my life at times where I believe, like I, I've heard with Thistle Farms, and you say many times, love is the most powerful force for changing our world, you know? But I've heard I'm so many about times. Tea while you're talking. I'm listening. I'm I've, I've heard so many his times. His questions are very long. Yeah. I, have, I got lost. <laughs> Y'all are the same cookie, huh? Well, it, hey, the last sentence. He'll, he'll it, it's okay. Hard. It'll just wrap It'll up. Just wrap yeah. up yeah. So the love is the most powerful force. Like, and right. love heals. I'll get contested sometimes that love really is not, it's not just love, that that's not practical enough, that that's not grassrootsy enough. That How does heal, love heal? You know, does love, and does it truly heal? Uh -huh. yeah. you know, I think people are still yes. asking that question. The answer is yes. Done. <laughs> <laughs> no, but How here's, I think now? it's because our love isn't usually practical and relevant to people's lives. We make it like this romanticized ideal, but like, what does love look like? If I'm coming out of jail and off the streets, what's love look like? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's this beautiful, brand new, how do you say it, posturpedic, beautiful yeah. bed yeah. with a comforter and mm -hmm. you give me space and money. Mm -hmm. That's what it looks like. So I can go to the doctor and I can go to the dentist and get my teeth back. Six months down the road, love won't look like that. It'll look like a job. Mm -hmm. It'll look like people who are advocates in court so I can see my children again. Six months after that, it might look like um, a car. Help me get a good deal on a car. Like love needs to be practical mm -hmm. and relevant. All of and it is. And it's action. Love is action. Yeah, and it's like daily. In it's a relationship. Like, if you're not knowing someone, you don't know that their next step is need a job. Or their next step is right and it's helping people i mean giving them the time and the space so they can do that healing work like i think it's important but i also think no offense to the music industry yeah but i mean like we've been kind of sold a bad good of sales about what love is okay i mean like in what manner well you... i mean love is kind of boring sometimes and it's daily and it's like mm -hmm. it's a cup of tea it's not like this big romantic thing that's going to happen and if i don't find that then it's unrequited and i'm right. unfulfilled sure. and right. i don't feel it and i've got the blues it's mm -hmm. like oh my gosh how about love is saying i will show up here today and i will show up here tomorrow and i'll pour you a cup of tea and we'll eat a scone together mm -hmm. It's consistent service. I mean, as we serve one another, do you like, okay, so I was reading on the website, Thistle Farms, heal, empower, and employ mm -hmm. is like this kind of mission statement of Thistle Farms. I think of that. Uh -huh. Okay. Maybe not mission statement. I just don't love that word in power very much. Do you? Oh, okay. empower? So what would you say? Why? Yeah, like. I don't know. You it don't feels want to empower like, people? Well, I just feel like women have power. Okay. The women so we you serve don't have need to power. Give them so it's just more yeah. uncovering the power that's already there. Or revealing there. the power. Or revealing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's part of it. Well, the, now, do you analyze, like I've noticed when he said a while ago, caught up. You analyze words carefully. Mm -hmm. So you said the women are caught up. Aren't they kind of? Can't you? I mean, an addiction is, it's not always the environment's fault, too. 
or our codependency. You know, it's not just. I mean, I'm codependent. It's not just the church not doing their job. It's you got to take some responsibility. I mean, Jesus asked the guy sitting there said, "Do you want to get well?" Mm -hmm. Before he healed him. So, how do you say that they're not caught up? I guess. I mean, they are caught up, obviously, but I guess. On average, the women that I've served for 21 years are first rate between the ages of 7 and 11. Mm. Oh, my God. I'm not, yeah. Mm. So huh. it, it, they were not given the not given any, easy any, leg any choice. You know, sometimes the women say it this way. Um, this, isn't my, this isn't a second chance for me. This is my first chance. Yeah. I never had a chance. My oh, mom wow. sold me to her boyfriends. I learned how to... Do what I do at the age of six. And that's the sex trafficking we're talking about. Yeah, you're human involved trafficking. in that mm -hmm. human trafficking. Mm -hmm. So that, and I mean, I'm literally oblivious to that. What is your experience how, how with that? Did, then? It's yeah. going on right here in Nashville, right here in Texas, and, my and all state. over the world. All right. over, mm -hmm. Not just in foreign countries. I mean, I, human trafficking, yeah. like modern day slavery, we've learned, yeah. is, an, is higher number of slavery. More people are enslaved in the world today than ever before. That's something. Who would thought? I would have never known. Oh, no, right. But you're experiencing this on a day-to-day -day level. You're seeing women who are... But when your mother mothers. sells you, that yeah. is as low as you can go. Your mo her mo their mother sold them to... I mean, yes, that happens. People have addictions and, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like if you are a drug dealer and you can sell a drug once, think how often you can sell a young woman. Sure. Thousands of times. It's valuable. And so... You know, on Are we making progress? Oh my gosh, I think so. I think it's weird because when we started out with that first house, the language wasn't the same. There was no language around human trafficking. Same issues, mm -hmm. no language around it. So we would think there were, you know, teenage girls on the streets that were just like you're saying, caught up in the life. Right. They were that crack, was fault, crack right? whores. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was awful language around what those young girls mm -hmm. were going through. And now there's a lot more compassion, especially by you know, church groups and people who have hearts to be able to make changes. So the thing I've seen with the word trafficking, with a new understanding of how childhood trauma really sets people up for a life on the streets and in prison is that, you know, we're changing laws. Mm -hmm. They've shut down Backpage. It was the largest place for exploiting women in America. It was seized two weeks ago, done. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, they're, they're seizing assets and properties and they're expunging records. Things are happening and they're changing. That's fantastic. And there's all this new information around trauma-informed care. You've heard of that. Mm -hmm. That wasn't there either about like, oh my gosh, part of the reason that you're out of control is because of trauma in your kid. And that's what I was going to say. Yeah, trauma-informed care, it says we're taking it to a new level. It's not just shutting down the back end or the logistics of how people are getting sold or getting trapped into sex slavery, but saying, as you come out, like not just leaving them there, mm -hmm. but saying, okay, so your life looks this way because your experience has been this, which at some level you had no choice about. Right. I am Regina Mullins, spent years on the street. Um, lost everything, including my three sons, custody of my three sons, my home, um, ended up on the streets, being in and out of dope houses, different motels, hotels, alleyways, abandoned houses, dope houses. I remember one evening, I was like, just so tired of getting high. I didn't want to get high anymore. I didn't want to turn one more trick. I didn't, I just wanted to go home. I wanted to be with my my sons and I prayed and I looked at God and I was like, help me, can't you see? I want, I want to be out of this. It was like a cop car came, a police car came down the street and I was a known prostitute at that time. And um, they stopped and they were like, if you be on this street when we come back, we're gonna take you to jail. And, and what I did was I reached down to pick up a brick and I threw it at the police car. And when I did that, of course, guess what? They took me to jail. And um, that started the beginning of um, a new life, which I didn't believe that at that time. I had made parole, and which scared me to death. Um, I was thinking, what am I gonna do? 
I couldn't go home. I had burnt that bridge. And one of the ladies that I had been incarcerated with called in. She's like, this lady has created this home for us to come to. She's like, she's an Episcopal priest. And she, we could stay for free for two years. And I was just like, an Episcopal priest? No, what does that mean? I'm finna be in confession every day? Or, you know, she's gonna have me doing Abba Fathers and Hail Marys? What, I am not finna come. And you're saying for two years? I just did two and a half years. And I'm not finna go and live under a priest. And I called her and she said, yeah, I qualified. I could, you know, maybe come and meet her and get into the program. I just kept thinking that there was some kind of hook because nobody is gonna allow you to live in their home for two years free. When we pulled up to the house and these women that I had been incarcerated with come running out of the house and they're, you know, looking like, I don't know, different. When I walked in, it was just like, it was just so beautiful. There was furniture, there was, you know, we walked down the hall, it was just plants everywhere and I walk into this bedroom and there's a real bed <laughs> in the place with a beautiful new comforter and curtains to match it and I'm walking to the kitchen and they got real dishes and pots and pans and, and I turned around and I looked at them and I, and I started crying. I was reminded of what home was what a home, what a real home was. And one Saturday, we were doing the chores in the house, and one of the girls said, have you met Becca? And I'm like, no, you know, where is she? Is she here? Because I was dying to meet this priest, right? So we walk up the hall, and I'm looking at her, and it was just surprising because she had on what I say, we call Daisy Duke shorts back in the day, and she had a midriff top on, and she had her second son, Kaney, on her hip, right, standing there, and she was barefoot. Where's the black shirt? Where's the collar? <laughs> you know, and she started to laugh at me, and I was just like still in shock of, she seemed like us. And she said, if there's a line between priest and prostitute, then it's a very, very thin line. She said, the difference with us is that I can share my brokenness with you, and you can share your brokenness with me, and we can come together and find a solution to help each other heal. I was looking for judgment, I guess, you know, but there was none. And it was like we were on the same playing ground, and this woman might be for real. It's like God worked through her to show me, okay, you want your life back. This is how you're going to get it. I used to tell Becca, my thing with love was, you know, you do something for me, I'll do something for you. And we found out that that's not it at all. That's why Becca, you know, says that love is the most powerful force that can heal, you know, our land. And we say that love heals because it really does. And it's not about going out and saying, you need God, you need some holy oils thrown all over you. You need to be ready and here's a place that you can come when you're ready when you're tired, when you're sick and tired of that last piece of dope, I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want anybody touching me anymore. Then we have a home, not a halfway house, not a treatment center, but a home, excuse me, but a home. And because of that, all those years ago, in 97, November of 97, um, yesterday, January the 16th, 2019, y'all, I got 23 years, 23 years, yes, because she threw me a lifeline, and I didn't have to go back to the streets. I've gotten a chance to be a mother again. I got a chance to get my boys back in my life. I got a chance to go back to school and get more educated. I got a chance to hold down a real job, a job that I love doing. That's why we've got to keep carrying this message. We've got to keep going to the streets. We've got to keep going to the neighborhoods. We've got to keep talking to the little girls. We've got to keep doing drug awareness seminars in the schools. We've got, we've got to keep it going because love does heal. You can help save thousands of lives by giving a generous gift to Food for the Hungry today. 
Your gift will directly help Rohingya refugees who are currently living in dire, poverty-stricken refugee camp conditions in Bangladesh. And get this, your gift will be matched 22 times for an exponential impact. Food for the Hungry is on the ground now, providing medical treatment to hundreds of thousands of these vulnerable children and their families. This is the example that has been set for us by Jesus, that we would help our neighbors in their time of need. And this is what Food for the Hungry is doing to help relieve the refugee crisis in Bangladesh. So you can give today, partner with Dinner Conversations as we partner with Food for the Hungry yes. by giving generously at fh.org forward slash dinner. And don't forget, not only will your gift be matched 22 times, but for every dollar you donate, we will enter you into a drawing for our season two grand prize giveaway. And what is the giveaway? It's dinner <laughs> with me and Andrew in Houston, Texas at my favorite restaurant. And right after dinner, we're coming back to Mark's house to be a guest on Mondays with Mark live broadcast. And your travel and accommodations are included. We also have a VIP package for everyone who gives $1,000 or more. Which includes some signed CDs, DVDs, and books from Mark and me, and also a stack of books and music from some of our season two guests, including Kathy Lee Gifford, Danny Gokey, Amy Grant, and the most special part is a handwritten. Oh yes, I'm gonna write your favorite line, whatever it is from Mary Did You Know, and you'll get that one, like when she kissed her little baby, she kissed the face of God. That's probably my favorite. Mm -hmm. And then I'll autograph that and send that to you and you can keep that. And then when I'm dead, it'll be worth two or three dollars. <laughs> so remember to give now, give generously at fh.org forward slash dinner. Every dollar is an entry into our season two grand prize giveaway. To learn more about Dinner Conversations, visit dinner-conversations.com. And while you're there, check out our Season 1 DVD with all of our past episodes and some bonus stuff, as well as check out these cool show mugs. Yeah, so when we have our next conversation, you can have coffee with us. Let's get back to the conversation. But now they have a choice. Like, I think about you and your work and the people who work alongside you empowering. How do you empower a woman who's shrouded in shame from potentially choices she wasn't even able to make, you know? Mm -hmm. How do you uncover? We, we said empower, don't like that. Therapy. How do, how do you uncover that power? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Therapy is right. In, in decent work. I mean, the reason we started a whole home and body care company was because, you know, women were doing great therapy, but they were still poor as dirt, so you're still vulnerable. Mm -hmm. You know, the violence and vulnerability of poverty is unbelievable. So if you're talking about love, yeah then you have to talk about economic freedom mm -hmm. for the women. So it's like, guess what? You get to choose what your kids wear because you're going to go out and buy the clothes. Mm -hmm. You're going to get to decide what kind of car you drive and where you live. And you're going to decide who you have relationships with. If this is an unhealthy person, get out. But So offering choices. So someone just Maybe tuning in time. or mm -hmm. just watching today who's never heard of Becca, never heard of Thistle Farms, how many women do you think Magdalene House Thistle Farms has helped? and actually mm -hmm. set free and got on the right path through the years. Restored, you know, yeah. that's what I, do you know? So we have about 200 women who have been a part, lived for the two years and graduated from the community. 85% of the women who come in graduate. But now what we've been doing because our waiting list is so long and because the need is so long and partly because we've gotten a lot of national stories, we get mm -hmm. referrals from all over the country. So we put a lot of our effort into starting new homes around the whole. We have two houses in Texas. Really? We Where? We have 56, 50 sister communities around the country. The latest one was in Seattle. We just opened one in Omaha. Mm. Oh, cool. um, it's in Kerrville, Texas yeah. and Austin, Texas. All right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those are the two places I in Texas. Not know so that. beginning a network. Mm -hmm. How do you find those? Are those people already active in? Those are people the, seeking us out and saying, teach okay. us how to do it. We okay. want to do this. We mm -hmm. want to have this model. How do? How would someone do? I mean, what would, are the requirements of someone to start a, a, a project like that? Well, the idea is that you kind of become a part of this aligned network and we share core values and principles. And the basic one is that we all are going to work together in a really alongside each other in a cooperative, beautiful way to serve the women in long-term housing first model that um, is free. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, women don't come off the streets with any money. Right. 
And if you make them go to a halfway house and you're charging them $150 a right. week, you know, guess how they They're going to have to find that $150, oh. yes. <laughs> so we're, we, so I, you're saying, like, I want you to be clean and I need $150. Right. <laughs> right, right. And you don't have a job. Right. I feel like we're in this culture, American culture, that is big on no handouts. I mean, we just say that all the time. You know, I don't want to give a handout. I want to give help. And what I see you doing is this really healing, holistic, restorative process. But I love what you're saying there because you're saying, well, it's not just a handout to, to give someone the opportunity sometimes through finances mm -hmm. to make a new life, right? Like, do you have to balance that? So People my dad going, was killed by a drunk driver when I was five. And my mom was 35 years old and there was five kids. And we became poor overnight. He was a minister. Didn't have a clue about life insurance, mm -hmm. retirement plan, you know. So free became the most important thing in our life. It was the biggest sign of God's grace. You know, we would, we would have prayer time that our tires wouldn't go flat. <laughs> and it's like, why are we praying that our tires don't go flat? The problem is we have bald tires and we couldn't afford new tires. Right. And so it becomes a theological issue like, yeah. God, please, please, <laughs> please don't let that tire right. go flat yeah. today. You know, just anything, you know. Yeah. And my husband got a record deal when we first got married. He went on the road. He was with Sony Records. And he was gone like 250 nights. And he said every night I would get on the phone and I'd go, how's the day, blah, blah, blah. Did you get the free shampoo out of the room? I'm like, if you don't take that shampoo, you are leaving money on the table. <laughs> like, free was the best. Right. Mm -hmm. It was just the best. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I always knew, like, the most stressful thing was when somebody made me pay for something. Mm -hmm. Free was God. And so I never even hesitated when I was like, no, we are doing this free for these, yeah. for the women that we are going to serve. It's free for everything. Does that say something about us, though, as, like, we've talked about this some with different people on the show, but as... We, as the members of the church, like I think about you and your family in that situation where your father's gone and the income is gone, and you praying that your tires aren't bald. And I'm thinking, if I was in your congregation, I hope I would see that your tires were well, bald. Well, the elder in the church, that same, right after my dad died, and this is how it works for kids, just so you mm -hmm. know how it works in churches, mm -hmm. the elder in the church began sexually abusing me for years at the age of six, and it started oh. in the fellowship hall of the church. So not only was the church not helping, Seeing, yeah, the need. it preys on the people who are probably the most vulnerable. Not all churches. I knew that wasn't the story of the whole church. Okay. I know that that's the story of abuse when people think they have power, power. over you. I've heard you talk about that before, how this, the same church that housed the predator of your abuse also helped you pilgrim into faith. Did, did that feel like, I think a lot of people have had that experience with quote unquote their church and that they've both experienced some sort of abuse, power struggle, oppression, and at the same time it's where they first started having conversations with God. Was that mm -hmm. hard for you to reconcile as you became older and- Did well, getting ready that I... help you find God? <laughs> I think that's what you're asking. You got some scone all over there. <laughs> Well, you know, I Hold love on. Oh, help me, Mama. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, but did yeah, I yeah. Did. No, I hear what you're saying, but I think what I want to I mean, like, I don't think as a kid, like, you go, well, this seems like this category and this category, and I need to separate this, and I understand this theologically and this practically. I think it's like you're just trying to find safety and home, mm -hmm. you know. And there were a lot of people that helped me do that, but I never. The biggest gift, the thing I run into with folks who have had those histories that I never had. It's like, I never thought it was God. I was uh -huh. never confused. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You knew good. it was that man. And I don't know why. You never put uh, uh -uh. God's face on that abuser. Never. Wow. I never thought, like, God let this happen, or why did God do this? Or it was just like, did you this is messed up. God I, loved you? I think I always knew, and I think I had such a good mama who was mm -hmm. so strong that it was like, God is love. God mm -hmm. loves you that I didn't have all that junk that goes along with it, that it made right. it a spiritual thing. Like, God was, a, that was good. Faith was good. Loving Jesus, mm -hmm. that's good. The idea of a community that keeps silence and abuse possible, that's bad. Mm -hmm. So how do we keep us, how do we make communities that are safe and loving that express how good God is? Yeah, yeah. It's, that's do, what I wanted my whole life. And do you feel like you're creating that there at 
Tesla Farms. Do you farm. think I am? It looks that way. But I mean, from the outside looking in. We should have eaten there. Mm -hmm. Someday. My name is Sheila Simpkins, and I am the Director of National Education and Outreach at Thistle Farms. Well, so I was born into a dysfunctional family. Um, I started getting molested at about the age of six, and so I was conditioned at a really young age to please men. We moved to California, went, uh, to Mountain View, California, when I was 14 years old. Um, my mom's fifth husband, and I ended up running away. Uh, I met a guy, he sold me a dream. Uh, and I started selling my body to take care of me and him. I was not really considered a runaway, uh, more of a throwaway, because my mom never really reported me missing to the, uh, to the police. Even though I ran from everything, uh, I still yearned for a relationship with my mom. Um, to be quite honest, I love her. I started working in a strip bar there um, as a waitress, and uh, I met a guy who uh, started feeding me drugs and then the next thing you know, I owed him. Uh, and we went ac across the country um, selling my body so that he could profit along with about three or four other girls. It's, it's called a stable. Um, he brought me to Nashville in 1997 and we worked Murfreesboro Road. I did, I met someone that was willing to play the game and he, he served the pimp and told the pimp that I chose up. And uh, I got a severe beating, and that's where I got all these scars out. I literally got a hole in my head um, from the abuse that I survived from him, and I still had that addiction. And so I stayed out on Murfreesboro Road for six more years, jumping in and out of cars to support my drug habit. And during that six years, I did two years at CCA and uh, got arrested 89 times for prostitution. In 2004, they were doing, uh, the Sir Farms Magdalene Residential was doing uh, an outreach. And for some reason, I walked over there because I just wanted to hear what they had to say. And I thought I was ready that day. So they put me in the car. They took me to where I was staying at so they can get my uh, clothes. And by George, I was going to get my stuff together. But I took a hit whenever I got into uh, <laughs> the apartment and did not come back outside. And so that day is the day that the seed was planted about the program. I went to jail about seven, uh, about two months later and um, got put into a drug court or recovery court. And um, they put me in a halfway house and um, I went and sold my body so that I could pay the rent and the cycle started all over again. And so I went to jail in September, actually September 16th of 2004. I was in jail for about 60 days and Magdalene became heavy, heavy, heavy on my mind. About 15 days later, I was back in court and being released to the Magdalene program and that was November 30th of 2004. Went into the program, broken, homeless, no life skills. I didn't go into the program because I was trying to get my life, life back because I never really had a life. I needed someone to teach me how to live. But five months into being into the Magdalene program, I got diagnosed with breast cancer. I'll tell you something, that breast cancer was the greatest blessing of my life because going through chemo, I lost all my hair. Um, and I used to be kind of vain. I stopped caring about what people thought they'd seen on the outside. Because when I was looking in the mirror and I really got to literally see all the, I literally have a road map in my head from uh, the abuse that I survived because I didn't get to go to the hospital. Um, so I, got, I, I stayed in the program, um, completed it, ended up um, getting married, which is the greatest gift of my life because now I have two beautiful children that think that they have the best mama in the whole wide world. And guess what? I think I am one of the best moms. My mom's now my best friend. Um, uh, she's someone that I talk to every day. And I can remember the day when I realized that, that
that I truly forgive her. And it's when my son was born and me and her were at the hospital. My husband chose to allow my mom to stay uh, at, at the hospital and he went home. And I got to have that conversation with her. I just want to tell you that I love you and I forgive you. And, and that's what love has given me, the ability to be able to forgive, to let go of that resentment, to take care, take that load off of my shoulders that I've been carrying for so, so many years. Love for me is, is being a good wife, um, being a good mother, being a good daughter, being a good employee, being a good friend. Um, giving back. Um, love can mean so much. Love is an action word to me. And like someone watching, like why, what can they do? Um, do we need, do they need to do anything? Do they need to support the Silk Farms? Do y'all need support? You know what? Do you have supporters? Or how do you? How does the Safarm support itself? Because you can't give money to these women if you have no money to give. So how do you get it? Right. There were so many questions. I don't know where to start. Oh, either. look, he's been taking after me. <laughs> no. Right, so here's you... what I say is Finally. that I think the first thing people need, like if you're listening or you're watching and you want to be a part of it, the very first thing is just love people without judgment. Mm -hmm. That's the best thing we can do. We want to heal this world and make it better and kinder, love people without judgment. And the second thing is you can support us. Go shop online. You do more than shop. It's like investing in women's freedom. That's mm -hmm. what I see. We have almost every manager is a woman who came through the program who's now training new women. It's a growing, thriving, sustainable, scalable business. Mm -hmm. And people can really invest. And then I think really if you guys and anybody else want to help us, the best thing is this. This is being a social media mm -hmm. advocate. It's like you get to share your story. Mm -hmm. We get to engage a new community. You get to tell whatever part of your story and how you feel empowered and love heals, and we keep going, and we can make differences. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the beauty of, of Start that. where you are. Start mm -hmm. where you are and be grateful. And that's love without an agenda. I heard someone say, mm -hmm. you know, not love someone to turn them into your denomination or your religion, but love them just for the sake sure. of loving them. Kind of yeah. goes against our it's evangelical, hard, yeah. my evangelical, like, like to evangelize has this certain tone with yeah, it's it. It's like you, know, you love them if you can win instead them. Instead of just, how about be their neighbor? Well, the thing I've learned is that a couple things. One is that when, when you really look at the gospel, it's not about changing the world to make it love you. Mm -hmm. It's really about loving the world. So that means you have to change or I have to change so I can love it better. Mm -hmm. So the whole changing is, if you, when you're reading the gospel, it's about us changing ourselves so we can love it better. Yeah. Can you love someone without agreeing with them? I mean, Absolutely. obviously you can. <laughs> but I just wanted to make that clear. I'm doing it right <laughs> now. I know. I know. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> no. Yeah, can you? I mean, I think a lot of time people, they will love you. It's the way I was raised and seeing in our denomination, you got to be one of us to really be accepted by us. But we are all one human, we're all human beings, right? Mm -hmm. And yet we divide. Mm -hmm. And so it does I guess seem like it's our nature to divide. Long. It does, it seems like it's almost intuitive to divide. And it is this challenge to unify, even though we know the benefits of being unified. And the benefits of creating sanctuary, being sanctuary. Mm -hmm. You know, like how, how do we as the church, and when I say we as a church, I think of we as the members of the church, as individuals, not as the American church, not as the local congregation on the street, but you and me and me provide sanctuary, sanctuaries. I guess that starts with what you're saying, right? I'm mm -hmm. answering my own question. Your you neighbor. answered it. Loving your neighbor, right? Mm -hmm. Is the best sanctuary to offer? Mm -hmm. Are there other ways, like, are there ways we collectively yeah, can become. Well, you know what? I have a gift. Can I tell you what my gift? The, one of the biggest gifts I have is I have a brother that's a Roman Catholic priest mm -hmm. who does not believe in women's ordination, and I'm a pastor, right? Mm -hmm. And he agreed with he agrees with Paul, then, right? <laughs> the apostle. 
Yeah, I know Paul. I met him. You know Paul. You've heard of him? <laughs> no, but... Women are to remain so silent in the church. My brother agrees with the Catholic Church, which is women do not are not allowed ordination. Right. That's my little brother. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and I've been ordained longer than he right. has. Yeah. It is the biggest gift because we love each other. Yeah. And we break bread and we laugh and we can debate and we... I don't want to spend Thanksgiving with anybody else. Yeah. So yeah. it's never been a problem for me to say, like, I can really disagree, even if you don't think I should be a pastor. Yes. I share sermons with him. We get sermon ideas together. Oh, yeah. great. I see. I, it's I, crazy. I, I love yeah. that. See, I think that's communion. I used to get a, a, a Chris, and I'm probably repeating myself, but I used to get a Christmas <laughs> card from Jerry Falwell and Tony Campola. I've never heard of this one. That's awesome. <laughs> well, let me finish it before you <laughs> say. And I would put them side by side on my refrigerator, because they were both friends of mine. And, and I would think every Christmas, my gosh, I know these men. I know they both love Jesus, and they came to diabolically opposed political conclusions. Mm -hmm. They debated each other on CNN, mm -hmm. you know? And they, they, they were actually friendly to each mm -hmm. other when they would see each other. But, why, but now in this climate, it seems like it's, it's more polarizing than it was. I think we have to get more creative. When it gets more mm. polarizing, we have to mm. get more creative because if it's just going to be a debate, we can pick a topic mm -hmm. and debate, and it's like what that does is I get really honed in my argument, and I'm very clear about what's wrong with you. Uh, you know, like, yeah. I know what he's going to say. Right. I know how he feels about this. He's going to say this, and so I'm going to say this. And it's almost like I can... I can do a whole argument with my husband. He does not need to be in the room. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tr I've done that with people. Right, and it's like... Guess what? I won the argument. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But if we get really creative, we can open people back up and open ourselves back up. Mm -hmm. So when we're involved in this work of justice, especially around folks who haven't had a fair shake, uh -huh. and we can tell the story again, which is why I think bath and body care products and lighting candles and making tea, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm engaged again. Yeah. I'm participating, and I never had to have the argument about the law or the politics of it. Because oh, yeah. when you look into the eyes of these women, women, do you sense? I mean, do you see any difference? Do you feel different? Do I see any difference? In yeah, like between you and them, is there any difference? Oh, there's not. Right. I mean, the line between, in my mind, between most pastors and prostitutes is pretty thin. Ooh, that if there's like a line. Lyric. I always think one the or line two steps. Between pastors and prostitutes That's, is pretty. Thin. His next record, it. Pastors and Prostitutes. You can use That's it. That's a great hook, Pastors and Prostitutes. <laughs> <laughs> you just stay with that. <laughs> He's texting Rima. I love how Jesus. You know, Jesus didn't second. mind hanging around prostitutes. Jesus and prostitutes. <laughs> pastors and prostitutes. I love that. I love that Jesus. Man, he hung around people we should, we, you know, I, the way I was raised, you're not supposed to be seen with. But he was always around them. You want to hear a funny story? Yeah. When Russ Taff lived across the street from me, right? Russ and Tori. And there was a woman who relapsed and gone back out to the streets. And I was like, oh, my gosh, we have to go get her. She can't come back to the house because she's dirty. Um, but we need to get her a hotel room so she's safe. I mean, we had had a woman that was murdered. Mm. That The first woman that ever relapsed was murdered when she mm. hit the streets. I didn't have a credit card, so I got I picked up Russ. And I'm like... Russ, we got to check her into this hotel. And he, we go down just over on Elston Place, and it's like the Hampton Inn or something. And I use his credit card. He and I are standing down there checking into a hotel room, you know, with an active right. woman selling herself on the streets. <laughs> and he was like, oh, my God, this is bad. And I'm like, here's the thing. Nobody cares, Russ. Mm -hmm. Like, I promise, like, if you're really doing it for the right reason, nobody cares. If we weren't, mm -hmm. right. people would really care. It right. would be news and right. it'd be interesting. But yeah. if you're really helping yeah. people, it's like, eh. <laughs> Isn't that sad? Like, it would have been yeah, that right publicity. Been the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah I really. Like, I know. A good, Russ good story Russ checking prostitute in a hotel. With his credit card. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a you paper could, trail. You couldn't even make the singing news. No, couldn't mm. make the singing news. Sad. <laughs> sad, sad but true story. When the miracle first happened in my life, um, I had grown up in church where there was so much judgment and so much condemnation if you couldn't walk perfect. So I was very protective about who I let in. And um, Becca and Marcus moved in across the street. 
and we began to uh, have dinners together and talk and hang out. And she said, come to my church. And one Sunday morning, I got up and I, I went to her church down on the Vanderbilt campus. And I'd never been around um, the uh, liturgy and the Book of Common Prayers and all of that. And it wasn't about a self-help sermon. It was about God and what we need to do to please him. And she walked and I walked, I mean, for exercise, and she said, let's walk. And as I began to open up a little bit, you know, when, when you're cautious how much you say because you don't know how people are going to react, uh, I began to talk to her, and nothing I said threw her. In fact, I asked her one time, I said, tell me about grace. And she said, grace is the ground we walk on. Uh, and she said, Russ, you need community. And I had a community with uh, my 12-step group but I needed a Christian community that I could grow in and feel safe. And so Sunday after Sunday, I would go, and I felt loved. I felt cared for. It was the first time for me that I experienced love and grace from a minister. I'm sure there were others that would have, would have given it, but I was afraid to tell it until I found someone that could handle my whole story and continued to walk with me in grace and love and encouragement. And I began to see why community is so important and sanctuary is so important for our growth. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. And with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary, Lord, for Prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. For you, hey everybody, Andrew Greer here, and I wanted to talk a little bit today about our season two title sponsor, Food for the Hungry. And really, more than title sponsor, I would call them our title partner. I have long been partnered with Food for the Hungry. I know Mark has personal experience as well, but my experience with Food for the Hungry goes back to 2012 when uh, some of my close friends there asked my good friend, Cindy Morgan and I, to partner with them on a tour that we were doing at the time called the Hymns for Hunger Tour. And we were going around from city to city in the United States helping local hunger relief out. And we thought, what could we do from an international angle to help international hunger relief. What I quickly discovered is Food for the Hungry is more than providing just the basic need of food, of relieving hunger, but really providing a core need, and that is a spiritual need of relieving a spiritual hunger. And of course, that is through the pathway of food, that's through the 
pathway of emotional help, mental help education, helping people provide shelters, basic needs, provide the medicines that are helping save the lives of their children and their family members. All those basic needs is a gateway to providing the greater need of spiritual hunger through Jesus. That is what we are hungry for. So I quickly began to relate to their name, Food for the Hungry, in a totally different way. What I loved about Food for the Hungry as well is that they're a very small footprint. They're a smaller organization. They're working uh, in more, um, they just have more ability to be a part of the community, to truly partner with the people in the community, not to take over, not to bring some kind of Western world way or attitude or understanding of how to provide for basic needs because those don't necessarily relate in every other uh, country or setting or community. It's a very personal experience trying to understand how to break the cycles of poverty in people's lives across the world. And so they work hand in hand with the resources that are there in a community. What was really interesting to me in Nicaragua is that there were these African killer bees that were just filling up the forest in Nicaragua and they produced a honey that was a huge export. I believe it was in... London. It was in Western Europe somewhere, maybe just in England at large, that they really had a strong desire and market for this honey. But the Nicaraguan folks didn't even know that the bees that produced that honey were right there at their fingertips. So what did Food for the Hungry do? They provided them training in beekeeping and how to actually um, use the resources that were right there in their neighborhood uh, to help their community develop and thrive um, so that the generational cycle of poverty could begin to be broken um, not just in their immediate lives, but in the lives of their children, which would also be the lives of their grandchildren, and so on. And so really what you're doing when you partner with Dinner Conversations, as we partner with Food for the Hungry, through your gift, uh, which can be given at fh.org forward slash dinner, what you're doing is you're helping break the cycles of poverty, those um, generational chains is what I think of. You're beginning to help people be free. So what we're asking as part of our partnership with Food for the Hungry during this Dinner Conversation Season 2 is just one-time gifts, but uh, child sponsorship is a big part of their background, and I sponsor a couple children from Nicaragua through Food for the Hungry. Mark sponsors a couple children through Food for the Hungry. And what I remember asking some of the grandparents of sponsored children when I went to Nicaragua is I asked the grandparents, I said, why is it even important that someone like me from countries away, from miles away, would be involved in the lives of your children. And I remember what one grandmother said, by you partnering, by you being someone who we don't know, and you don't know me, I don't know you, but you being willing to partner with our children and with our family's lives, is that I've learned that God has no borders, no boundaries, and in fact is a wild frontier. And that opened my mind and heart to the fact that indeed God uh, is bigger than our languages, he's bigger than our cultural traditions, he's bigger than the color of our skin, he's bigger than the way that we relate to one another, which can often be different. You know, we don't always understand how our neighbors relate to each other. It's not the same way I might relate to you or you to me. And so I learned about how that God, uh, of course we're created in his image, is being reflected throughout the many people. As we support people, as we partner with people who are not like us and who are in different situations than us, uh, I feel like I begin to chip away a little bit at the mystery of who God is and who He might be as I experience life uh, through the lens of our neighbors across the world. And that's one of the many reasons, that's my personal experience with Food for the Hungry, and a big reason why I was so thrilled that we were able to partner with them for season two. Your gift, one-time gift, goes straight to helping relieve the Rohingyan refugee crisis in Bangladesh, which is um, people in a poverty of a whole different, um, it's different than what I saw in Nicaragua because it's a poverty that comes through displacement from a people group that has no home. And Food for the Hungry is working with them. They're a group of people who lived in Myanmar for years and then because of some persecution and, and um, really some violent uh, hostile conditions in Myanmar had to cross the border to Bangladesh where they found a safe haven but no room. And with no room comes a lack of food, a lack of shelter, a lack of education, a lack of all the things that we know are key ingredients 
um, to keeping uh, communities out of poverty. And so Food for the Hungry is working specifically there right now to alleviate the immediate needs, which many are medical, and then to begin to find a long-term solution for these people, for the Rohingya refugees. Your one-time gift is directly impacting uh, the relief of the refugee crisis there through Food for the Hungry. You can give today at fh.org forward slash dinner and know that your gift is literally multiplied 22 times. If you were to give a $1,000 gift today, that would be $22,000 um, invested into Food for the Hungry's work with the Rohingya refugees. I don't know, you know, many more places you can get that kind of return on your donation. So I think that's pretty amazing. I think it's pretty fantastic. And it just is a further testimony to how Food for the Hungry is really utilizing their resources efficiently to do the, do the long work, um, which I believe the long work still is, is relieving spiritual hunger, but we do that by, we've seen that in Jesus' example, and during his ministry meeting immediate needs so that the eternal need, um, so that there's access to the solution to the eternal need, and that is Jesus himself. Uh, it's hard to see Jesus sometimes when you're hungry, and it's, um, it's hard to maybe believe he cares if you don't have a home. And so by us here, people with skin on, by helping provide uh, those basic needs for other people. Um, I think the veil, like that spiritual veil over our eyes, the things that keep us from really seeing God in the everyday, um, suddenly those are lifted and uh, we experience life through an entirely new lens. So you're not just helping, you are helping people with their immediate needs, um, but your dollar is uh, is making an eternal impact in people's lives. So I think that's pretty cool. And I think it's pretty cool that through our little conversations we get to have with some of our friends and that we get to have with you, that we also get that we're honored to have these opportunities to um, motivate the conversation in the lives of thousands of people across the world. This tea <laughs> is good. Cheers. Cheers. Dude, can Call. you cheers with tea? I don't know. Is what that is that it? Very Thistle English? dot com. Thistle farms. Thistle farms. Thistle farms. Dot com. No, no I'm wrong. What? That's not the code, what it's called. Oh, what is it? I've only done it for twenty one. You're right. It's org. It's Thistle farms. Org. I looked it up last night. Yeah. Okay, here. Tre yeah. Cheers again. Thistle cheers. Farms. <laughs> Thistle farms. <laughs> dot org. Not only can you order this delicious tea, you can order bath oils and candles. candles. And, and you're helping women that need to ha need help get off the streets and get settled and get a job. And oh, what a great, great thing to be a part of. And I, and I tell you what, it's planting good seed. You know, you hear all those people on TV, these TV preachers. They say, plant your seed, you know. And they put their 800 number up there. Mm. But they don't ever talk about the soil. Mm -hmm. And when you plant your seed, you better make sure the soil's good if you want to harvest. And this is good soil. I believed in this soil for a long time. It's good. Thank you, Mark. Thank you both. I love this. Um, Only 90 calories. Uh uh. That's what Shelly said. That's what, per. Per, per bite? Yeah, you got 180 yeah, exactly. per bite. <laughs> Why don't we just one bite? If you can eat the whole thing in one bite, it's fine. <laughs> First of all, this is cold. Sorry, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All for Jesus. Do you want me to consecrate it? Then it's I know he walked up a hill, but please, can I have a warm scone? Okay. <laughs> Train of thought, okay? Are y'all good friends? We go with mine. Yeah, we know each other. Um, I'm a friend. <laughs> Thank you very much. You just being mean or are you good friends? <laughs> We're good. You've been born of the Spirit of God. Let me come talk to them this face. <laughs> What a ministry that little Episcopal priest, Becca Stevens, has accomplished. Sure has, and if you want to hear more about her ministry, you can read and check out her new book, Love Heals, through our Amazon affiliate link below in our episode description. And if you want to binge watch all of season two of Dinner Conversations, you can do that right now on Amazon Prime. Who wouldn't?
Yeah. Thanks for watching Dinner Conversations with Mark Lowry and Andrew Greer. Turning the light on. One question at a time. Dinner Conversations is brought to you by Food for the Hungry, a relief and development organization serving those in need around the globe for more than 40 years. Help our friends at Food for the Hungry save thousands of refugee lives today by considering a generous gift. A gift that will be matched 22 times. It's incredible. Visit fh.org forward slash dinner to give now.